Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I know I'm standing between you and food, maybe. Hmm. Hmm. I better make it interesting, huh? Okay, I've got three things to talk about today. IPv6, but I've heard that you've already heard a lot about that, so I'll go pretty quick. Then I'll be talking about map which, how many people kind of know what map is, and I don't mean Google Maps. Okay. Um, and HomeNet, which should be obvious from the title, but I'll be talking specifically about what the IETF is doing here. So IPv6, this is a little chart of some of the uh, statistics that we've been gathering. You can go look at this at sixlab.cisco.com. It pulls in statistics from a variety of places. But it talks about, um, it, it tries to visualize some of the uh, end user deployment in this particular um, uh, view that we do view it from other, other methods as well, such as transit uh, uh, capability of IPv6, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, content, et cetera. This is end user, and we've got little bits and percentages here and there. Um, France still in the lead, et cetera. But this is a, perhaps um, something I wanted to, to focus on a little bit more. Um, of course, France took off uh, de delivering IPv6 to end users using 6RD and still has part of is the bulk of IPv6 that we see uh, from the perspective of, say, Google or a Yahoo or a Facebook seeing IPv6 coming in end to end. Uh, still, half of Europe is France. But the good news here is about a year ago, that green France took up pretty much the entire slide. Everybody else combined was in a tiny little corner, okay? What we've seen since the World IPv6 launch last year and uh, again a, a little bit after that since the beginning of the year is Romania coming online in strides and then Germany showing up. And it looks like this. And they're doing it with native IPv6. So 6RD got us off the ground. It's doing a great job. It can continue to do a great job for operators that need it, but we're also seeing native IPv6 pick up. Uh, Romania just like <laughs> pulled out all the stops. It was amazing. <laughs> but then that's, that's about it. They've been kind of holding steady since then. Um, the Germans, you know, up and to the right, perfectly in line, 45 degree angle. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, that's a, um, you know, two orders, two orders of magnitude increase in five months from 10,000 to a million users, roughly. Um, so what are you going to, what, what can we do with that native IPv6? So I want to talk a little bit about MAP. One thing that we can do is we can deliver IPv4 with it. Um, how many of you have heard of D dual stack light? Okay. A little bit more than MAP. Dual stack light looks like this. Um, don't let the light part fool you. Uh, it's not necessarily all that light. It's if you like tunnels and you like doing that, it's it's light. Um, but if you don't, then you know it's it, be, beware of anything that's called simple or light. It's probably not. Um, the idea behind dual stack light is is. In the world, in a world of IPv4 exhaustion, but where you have IPv6 deployed in your access network, you can tunnel IPv4 over IPv6, keep turn off IPv4 in this access network, and do all your NAT in the service provider, and you can have more serve more homes than you have IPv4 addresses, because you're able to share one IPv4 address across multiple homes. But this is a very stateful process. You're basically taking the NAT out of the home router and virtualizing it in a big piece of gear sold by a big company like I work for for lots of money in your network rather than sitting in the home network. So oddly, this has turned out to be one of the deployment models that I showed uh, uh, earlier for some of the service providers. The reason being it's really the only option you have if you want to, if you don't want to actually do double NAT of your users, okay? In terms of readily available deployed products that work end to end um, in the industry, say, a year or so ago. Now, there's another thing 
lightweight four over six, also known as public four over six, or four four over lightweight four six or public four over six. It's really the same kind of stuff. But instead of pulling the gnat in, we leave the gnat out and carve up the uh, address space such that you, you, you basically say, all right, here's your IP address, you get these few ports, this is your IP address, you get those few ports, et cetera. And you keep a table of that in this box. So there's still point-to-point -point tunneling, much like, say, a LAC LNS setup, right? An L2TP tunnel or something. that's carrying all your IPv4 traffic over IPv6, and then you put it all back together before you route it to the internet. So it gives you that IP address sharing, but it keeps the NAT out here. It's still not the best we can do, though. MAP has that same property of keeping the NAT at the customer edge exactly where it is now, except for now what we're going to do is we're going to use, we're going to really use the IPv6 that we have in the network to get some really incredible scaling properties. The other stuff, you could have just done IPv4 over IPv4. It didn't really matter that there was IPv6 underneath. MAP actually starts to use that IPv6 underneath, which is really important and really exciting about the technology. So to explain what I mean there, imagine a world first, let me step back, imagine a world with no IP aggregation. So what would the internet look like? if we didn't have aggregation. Hmm. Probably wouldn't scale all that well. We have really big routing tables. But it might be kind of cool because I could assign any number, any IP address I wanted to anywhere, and it would just work. And I could keep it as I moved around. I'd have magic mobility, right? So there's a trade-off here, right? You can have, give out whatever IP address you want, as long as it's allocated to you, um, advertise it into the system and it just follows you around. You get mobile IP without tunneling. But, of course, you, there's a price to pay. Uh, orders and orders of magnitude in terms of the uh, equipment costs that would have to, and, and routing protocols, et cetera, that would have to uh, be developed to keep up with this. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we look at any of the point-to-point -point tunneling properties, right? When we're, we're talking about um, such as lightweight 4 over 6 and public 4 over 6, they give you the advantage of full separation between whatever's running underneath, whether it be IPv6, IPv4, or pick your favorite protocol in your access network, and the IP that's being delivered to the customer. So that you, you, you're, you're, you don't have to mix these two together at all. So you can give the customer at home any IPv4 address, any set of of TCP and UDP ports for that particular IP address that you want. And that sounds really, really nice. And, and there's a lot of operators that go, yep, I want to make sure that I can give my custom, this customer this IP address, IPv4 address, that customer that IPv4 address. He gets ports 1,000 to 2,000. He gets ports 3,000 to 4,000. And I want to keep that flexibility. But it comes at a cost. And the cost is you lose the aggregation. It's like running the internet without any prefixes, just host routes. Tunnels. So if you have millions of subscribers, you have this whole network, and at some point, you've got to have millions of tunnel endpoints in probably some big box that we sold you for lots and lots of money. Um, I, it, in a former life, I, I, I wrote all the code and the standards for LTTP. I know about big tunnel concentrator things, OK? It's working all over the place, but you know, I, I, I've learned there's a better way. When you're tunneling something very similar in the two tunnel layers, IPv4 and IPv6, IPv4 and IPv4, they're very similar. Different than layer two tunneling. It's very different things that you're tunneling. You're tunneling layer two over layer three. But if it's IP over IP, you can look at it and go, all right, maybe if I am careful in how I set things up and how I set up my numbers, I can get some interesting advantage. So I'm not doing a lot of emulation between layers. It's just IP on IP. And that's what we're doing with MAP. We're exploiting the IPv6 aggregation. You've already got this nice network with 
huge number space, nicely laid out with prefixes everywhere, why not try and use that when you route your IPv4 on top of it? It's easy as one, two, three. And I'm gonna step you through it. How many in here have heard of 6RD? I talked about it a minute ago, but how many know what it is, 6RD? 6RD is how you magically get IPv6 to all your users without changing your IPv4 network. And it uses the same kind of technology. It's what France used to get you know, to the top of the list pretty quickly uh, in terms of IPv6 deployment. Great stuff. The map is 6RD upside down. So you've got your IPv6 network that's deployed. You want to run IPv4 over it and deliver it as a service. Because you've got, say, 50% of your traffic is Google, Yahoo, YouTube, whatever. That's going native IPv6. But you've got to keep the IPv4 alive. And MAP lets you do it without a big carrier-grade NAT. No big stateful NAT. And without even a tunnel concentrator like an LNS and L2TP. Because we're merging the routing together. And we're not only routing the IPv4 addresses inside IPv6, we're going to route the ports. And that's why you get IP sharing. So, one, two, three. First thing, the mapping, what I talked about. You have this sort of complicated looking thing. There's a lot of variables, all that kind of stuff. I like examples. Here's an example. Remember, the idea is you're delivering IPv6 only through the access network to the residential gateway. You're not provisioning D with DHCP for IPv4. You're not using PPP, IPCP. You're not doing any of that. You're not giving him an IP address uh, through any sort of IP protocol, IPv4 protocol. You're going to magically glean it from his IPv6 provisioning. So let's say your policy is a slash 56 IPv6 delegated prefix to the home. And the first 42 bits are the same for your entire deployment because you have aggregation. All your users sit inside a slash 42 in this example, but each are getting a, their own little slash 56. The green blocks is their own little slash 56. Those bits vary for every customer, but the blue box, same for all customers. And then the customer gets the gray box because he, can, he gets subnet IDs so that he can have multiple links in the home. We're going to talk about that. And then he gets his interface ID. Now, this is where the magic is. Now, we're going to have to provision one thing is an IPv4 prefix aggregate that you're going to not just use individually one per customer, but you're going to use across many more customers than that because you're going to get this IP address sharing built in. That's coming in just a minute. But slash 24 in this case is going to go to 65,000 customers. I'll get that same slash 24. It makes your provisioning a lot easier. Because all the blue stuff is the same for a big group of customers. Okay? The green stuff is what changes. But the green stuff here for V4, we're just gonna we're gonna drop it down. We're gonna take it from the bits from V6. So now I've got a unique IPv4 address and port range for a customer. So the customer gets to play around with the gray. That's an IPv4 and port there. So for this example. Two to the six uh, port sets per IPv4 address. So you get a multiplication factor of 64 to 1. So for every IPv4 address you have, you can serve 64 homes. And then the, the user gets, in this example, uh, 1,000 ports for his NAT to utilize. He's got 1,000 ports on the WAN side. He uses... He, Everything stays the same on the LAN side. It's just that he tops out at 1,008 ports in this case. Now, all of this is variable. But so a slash 24, this is the other statistic, a slash 24, which normally would serve with 250 users, can serve 65,000 users. Okay, so you're using that V6 aggregation to get IPv4 service and the IP address sharing pretty much for free. Now, if you want to play around with the variables here, because maybe 1,000 ports isn't good enough for you, you want to give 2,000, you want to give 5,000, whatever, right? However big your V4 prefix sizes are. Here's a tool you can go to, sixlab.cisco.com slash map, and you can move these things around, and it'll automatically tell you what the ratios are. If you don't like using web interfaces, go to Google Play. You can download, uh, search for a map calculator, 
and you can touch screen. The touch screen's great for this. And of course, for the iPhone fans, you can go to the iTunes store and look for Cisco Map Calculator, and you can play around this all night long in the bars tonight and go, ooh, I'm changing prefixes. It's really cool because what it tells you, this prefix, this prefix, with this many IP addresses, I get this many users. So you can see the multiplication factor right there. And it's, it's really fun. Um, that was number one. That's the heart of it. We're setting up this mapping between v4 and v6 addressing. Number two, stateless border relays. This is the kind of equipment that you have to have. Now the stateless border relay, it's a border relay because we're just calling it a relay, not a concentrator or anything like that, because we're not, while we're tunneling, we're doing encapsulation, decapsulation, we're not aggregating, bringing in a whole concentrated set of stateful tunnels. We're just performing this relay operation. So when traffic, I'll get, to, I'll get to exactly how that works in a minute. But the point is that each, you basically set up a handful of map rules, you push it down to all your border relays, and then traffic, as it comes in, magically gets converted from uh, V4 over V6 back to V4 and gets routed to the end users. Packet flow and forwarding, that shows it. In fact, users that talk to one another within the same network, within the same domain, don't even ever pass through the, the border relay equipment. So all of that, any sort of peer-to-peer, bit-torrenty, what, whatever kind of traffic that's going peer-to-peer, -peer, never even sees the border relay. It just gets tunneled home-to-home -home automatically. Um, so we only deal with traffic to the internet or coming from the internet. And for the traffic to the internet, we don't even have to care what border relay we're going to send it to. No configuring the IP address of the tunnel endpoint. We're just going to throw it out on any cast. It'll hit any of them. I don't care which one because it's stateless. And it automatically load balances, automatic failover, everything. So in the IETF, we've been working on this technology. It's got lots of different names, bits and pieces, and all this kind of stuff. I'll show you a sort of a lineage of how it's all been forming. One thing I want to point out, one of the recent discussions is map E versus map T, two different variants. Exactly the same algorithm, exactly the same idea, same scaling properties. The difference is a beauty contest between how the packets look on the wire from one point to the other point. Okay? The map E version uses encapsulation. We take V6, we put it in V4, it's IP and IP. I'm sorry. We take V4 and we put it in V6. I'm used to 6RD. We take V4 and we put it in V6. We send it across and take it back off again. It's really quite simple and attractive. Um, the map T, we translate the header from V4, yeah, V4 to V6, and then we translate it back from V6 to V4. End to end, it's exactly the same. The difference is what it looks like in between and whether that matters or not. So here you go. Private IPv4, private because it's RFC 1918 space in the home, just like you have today. You go through your NAPT in the home with your ALGs just like you do today. You have a restricted set of ports. You use a global IPv4 address. You in-cap in V6. You decap V6. You check the mapping to see if the... Uh, you know, make sure that the... It's a security check to make sure that nobody's trying to inject stuff and then you forward IPv4, IPv4 internet. Woohoo! I have now um, uh, used my IPv6 network to give IPv service. Map T looks like that. You see the difference? Ooh, big difference, right? The only difference is instead of adding and taking away the header, I'm going to replace the v4 header with the IPv6 header. Boils down to 20 bytes huge arguments over 20 bytes. It's amazing. Ultimately, we decided to go with one standard approach and then publish the rest as sort of informational experimental. We helped decide that with a flip of a, a, coin, a coin during a meeting. It was great. No, no, I, I don't have the video in this deck. Sorry. Um, there's this summary, encapsulation, well-understood symbol, translation. The 
the, the proponents of translation, it, 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 it boils down to a few things. One, if you have some ACLs in your IPv6 part of the network, and you want them to work on this traffic without having to look inside and find the IPv4, it's handy, okay? Because it's 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 kind of sort of IPv6 traffic. It's IPv6 traffic that hasn't been through an ALG and never should actually be destined for a host because it's just going to be untranslated. The other thing is it feels like real IPv6. So literally, some, if you look at the lineage of these technologies, it's like the technology came along and then got to the IETF and people started to realize, oh, we invented the same thing. How can we make it work together and stuff like that? And part of the MAP-T lineage is from folks working on translators that had a pretty strong uh, directive that they should have native IPv6 on their link and tunnels don't count. So this, this way, it's translation, but it's really architecturally still tunneling, okay? So don't get fooled. Map T is still tunneling. Map E is still tunneling. It's just a question of you're compressing away a few bytes or not in transit. Cisco will support both. Um, but ultimately, Map E will be published as standards track. Map T, 4RD, there are other variants. Now, I talked about lightweight 406 and public 406. If you take that little map tool and play around with the algorithm and you get it down to what we call one-to-one, -one, so you're not doing any port sharing, you're just uh, mapping one IPv6 uh, prefix to one IPv4 address played around, you get to one-to-one one, one -one mode, that's effectively what lightweight 406 is. It's encapsulating v4 and v6 after it's been natted up to a point in the network. So it's not getting the full um, aggregation that I was talking about. But some, it's, it's, a, it's a perfectly valid mode of operation. The thing is, the way things get have evolved, it ended up as its own thing, right? Which is great when you're marketing because you get to sell three or four things as different things when underneath, it's just still the same mechanism, but it's really terrible when it comes to standardization and getting things to interoperate, particularly when it comes to CPE equipment because CPE vendors don't care about fancy protocol names, right? They just want it to work and they don't want to support 10 different ways to do the same thing. So we're working very hard in the IETF on what we call the unified CPE approach. So at least the CPE guys have one thing to implement and on the other side, Big vendor can sell you lightweight four over six, say it's the best. Public four over six, say it's the best. Map T, say it's the best. Map E, say it's the best. And it'll always work with any CPE. Okay, so some balance between standardization and letting the marketing or market decide. So I do have a couple of slides of Cisco products up here. Sorry, I wanted to, um, I'm not selling stuff, but I wanted to show you, I'm selling the technology, but I'm not selling the boxes. But I did want to show you that on our gear, our dual stack light, which requires centralization on a, on, a, on a big blade plugged into the box, runs at about 14 gigabytes per slot, the user traffic on the ASR9K. Whereas MAP, you just put the line cards in. Everything runs in the line cards. You don't have to go to some central slot anywhere. So you get... An ASR 9K with 24 10 gig cards gives you 254 gigabits of throughput. It's line rate because it's stateless and it doesn't need that centralized uh, uh, lookup or that centralized NAT. Um, 19010 chassis, you can push 1.68 terabytes of v4 over v6 if you really want to. So the scalability is clear. There's proof. This is shipping, um, and uh, it's 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 nice to see it. In sum, you have to have v6 deployed in your access network to do any of this. Fancy um, IPv, it's, it's a way to, to share IPv4 addresses in the world of IPv4 exhaustion um, without having to, utilizing the routing underneath, the IPv6 routing, rather than uh, utilizing big stateful uh, carrier grade NATs. 
that's good for the internet. It's not good for our CGN product guys, maybe, but it's really quite good for the internet, the growth of the internet overall, and that's important to Cisco. Um, Light, Lightweight 4.6 is lighter than DS Lite, but both are heavier than MAP. Um, the IETF is converged on part of uh, the, the myriad of solutions, and we're trying to get that last step to make the CPEs uh, more easily interoperable. Now I'm going to switch gears because that was too much talking about delivering IPv4. I really want to talk about IPv6, uh, or else Jan will shoot me. Um, so I co-chair this working group called IETF HomeNet. And what we're trying to do is raise the bar in home networking. Now I'm going to tell you at the end, don't be fooled, it's not just about the home. But in terms of focusing on a deliverable, we're looking at how to get IPv6. Once it's to the home, how do you get it beyond the gateway and into the home? Something you really didn't have to worry about as much in IPv4 because you got that big gnat making this this separation between the networks. And for good or for ill, that separation was there, so you didn't really have to think about it. But with IPv6, the unless you want to just recreate IPv4 with a NAT, you've got to start thinking about how do I get all those devices numbered in the home with IPv6 addresses coming from the ISP without uh, without the luxury of having a NAT there, in fact. The NAT actually makes it easier in terms of uh, some of the, the, the ways we design things. But if we can get the IPv6 addresses distributed into the home, then we'll really reach the end-to-end. -end. That's the whole purpose of, of having so many IP uh, addresses out there. And if we don't, then we, why, why did we bother in the first place? So the principles here are that no matter how many routers there are in the home, no matter how they're connected, because this is the home, it's got to work for you, your, your mom, it's got to work for, for uh, my seven-year-old, it's got to work for anything. Right? No matter how they're connected together, they're going to work. That, that you're going to get ample IP address space, routers shall know where to send the packets, names should resolve to addresses, and human touch is not required. Okay. We're really operating, we're the, we are the IETF, we are operating at layer three plus or minus a layer in this, uh, in this effort. Okay. We're not talking about you know, how you, you set up your, your, your Ethernet links and your, your WPA or whatever you use. But really, once that's set up, how do you get IP configured in the home without using a NAT? And we're, the way we're going to reach that bar is the Home Net Working Group. First of all, we had a kickoff meeting at Comcast. Of the 120 IETF working groups that meet, um, not, they don't all meet, there are 120 plus working groups, they don't meet every meeting, but a lot do. Uh, Home Net ends up being in the top three in terms of uh, participants. And I don't think that's because we have so many home router vendors coming to the IETF, that's actually not true. But we do have a lot of enthusiasts that want their home network to work better. And so we get a lot of participation. Uh, Cisco set up a home net tech fund. This is a technology fund that's sort of off separate from any sort of business unit that lets us fund work that we think is important. And we've been, and it's one of its missions is to fund open source development of the work that we're working on in the IETF to kind of seed the home router marketplace. Because the home router marketplace just lives and breathes on open source development. And you can contribute yourself if you're a hacker. Um, this will be in the, in, in, the, in the slides. You can click on that, and you can see what we're doing. This is all basic plumbing stuff. We're plumbers. Um, when you boil down to the actual technologies we're working on, again, multi-router, multi-ISP. We want to enable multi-homing and make that work seamlessly. Arbitrary topologies so we can create loops, and it'll still work. Automatic IP prefix config, name resolution, service discovery, so you can find your printers even on different LAN segments. You can go look at the documents there. Why, why do I care about multiple routers? A question I get all the time is like, well, I've got one gateway, and then my home is all just one bridged thing. Well, let's look at the evolution of a home network. We started out, it was just one PC. Um, then, you know, Linksys came along or whoever and uh, you know created this Wi-Fi thing and started faking out 
um, the network. So we have these private addresses over here that make the NAT makes it look like one address. But then, you know, the fancier new Linksys came along, and you know what? Look, look what we did here. We, we actually gave the same address on the LAN side. So all of a sudden, these, th these two hosts couldn't talk to each other. And what did the um, users do? Well, they took the box back to the store and said, this thing doesn't work in my home network. And they swapped out with a D-Link. And it worked. It only worked because they happened to use a different address here. This is an actual real life story. Um, that's sort of the state of, of, of affairs in the home networks. It's like, oh, throw a bunch of NATs together. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. We're pretty sure that we can get you to Google, but within the home, who knows? Maybe. Then, um, you know, we've had our, our, our Apple revolution. You put your, your, uh, your time capsule out there. That's another router. Um, your company wants to get you to work at home as well, at, at night as well as during the day, so they give you this fancy VPN thing. That's another router. Ooh, the smart grid's coming along with their IP connected everything. That's another router. You've got your sensor networks, and oh, those, I'm talking about the evolution of an IPv4 home network here. But this thing only works on IPv6. So what do you have to do? You have to have a little NAT64 application gateway thingy, and it comes with an antenna so that it can attach uh, wirelessly to your network. But it's also got a plug on the back of it, so you plug that in, and oh, now you got a loop, right? Um, did I mention? VMware, Parallels, any kind of virtual VM that you want to run on your Windows box to get Linux or your Linux box to get Windows, there's a little router in there. So this is not that far-fetched. And I haven't even, whoa, whoa. I haven't even talked about hi-fi, home automation, home security, these kinds of new things, the Internet of Things, Barely talking about it here, right? And already I'm at 10 routers. So let's abstract this from the way the IETF is looking at it. I got some topology, it's arbitrary, it may have loops in it. What do I do? I do routing. Now, OSPF in the home, how do we do that? And how do we do it even when we're connected to multiple uh, ISPs? First thing I have to do is I have to detect my borders. And we're working on that, being able to do that automatically so that we can know when the router is connected to an ISP. And each ISP, of course, is going to give you a unique prefix, maybe of a different size, 56, 48, 60, whatever. We have a routing protocol running in the home that bootstraps in an automatically configured way. I'll call it ZOSPF or ACOSPF. This also could be ISIS. That's recently coming up. Um, but basically, we want to identify the border routers, eliminate loops, and advertise usable prefixes. What is a usable prefix? It's like a delegated prefix in IPv6. You have this slash 56 or 48 or 60. You basically want to spray. First thing you want to do is that's A, B, and C. A, B, C, A, B, C, everywhere. You've got to tell all the routers about all the prefixes that they could possibly use. Okay, It's like you're your DHCP pools that you're handing out um, uh, addresses to the directly connected hosts. The next thing you've got to do is decide which link, first of all, where a unique link is. Because between, for example, these three routers, right, I have, or these five routers, I have one link. And it only needs one slash 64 from each of the prefixes. And I need to do that in a way that converges. And if you look down here, we have an academic proof on how it all works, and it converges, and everybody gets 1 slash 64, and it's efficient, and all that kind of good stuff. So that's step three. Step one was finding the borders. Step two, eliminating loops. Step three, advertise the usable prefixes and um, the uh, slash 64s for the links. And finally, um, route packets based on source and destination. We're not just going to do destination-based forwarding. If we had time, I would make you tell me why. The reason why is BCP38. These guys are going to filter prefixes based on source address. So you've got to pay attention. And this guy, this host, and I, I picked something, you know, with like, because of the, the theme here. Um, you got this fancy host. IPv6 allows multiple addresses on a given host. 
might sound like complexity on one hand, but it's actually really, really powerful. And it's a differentiator between v4 and v6. The fact that I can have multiple addresses on this thing means that the ISPs, or maybe an ISP with multiple prefixes, can, can signal information, can, can, can propagate information about the network to the host, such that now the applications can make decisions like, oh, am I uh, connected to the blue network or the red network or the green network? Uh, I'm gonna use that particular path by selecting the proper source address. Because the source address chooses the, destin the, the egress point. In this case, even if they're all talking to the same uh, uh, World of Warcraft or whatever server on the other side, based on their source address, they're gonna take different paths out because we're doing source and destination routing. Luckily, an implementation of this is already in the Linux kernel and it was a compi compile flag option in order to implement this. So. I said before, don't let home in the title fool you. HomeNet is more than just about the home, but don't tell anyone or they might get over, like, come try to blow us up or something. We are doing automatic prefix distribution assignment in some of your favorite routing protocols. Maybe that would be useful outside the home. Uh, we're also exploring IPv6 multi-homing without NAT. And this is a well-known problem in IP circles. You have to choose between NAT, tunneling, or injecting uh, uh, PI prefixes into the BGP uh, routing system, exploding the uh, routing table. We're actually trying to get it to work multi-prefix so that every, every uplink gets to advertise a prefix and the hosts get to have addresses from each prefix. So we're putting that multi-prefix, multi-address architecture that's been in IPv6 from the beginning, but never really used, to the test. And when we do that, we can start exposing to the applications things that a multi-homed host knows today. I take my phone, it tells me, oh, you're connected to Wi-Fi, I'll download that really big file. You're connected to 3G, I'm not going to download that really big file. If this is a host connected in a home with two uplinks, if I'm using IPv6 with multi-prefix, I can carry that information when I configure the prefix and he can make exactly the same decisions he does today based on the uplinks that are present outside the home and normally is hidden from the host. So we're, we're taking that, that multi-home information and, care, and bringing it up from layer two into layer three. So that's one of the things, in addition to multi-homing, that you get when you start connecting all the dots here. So it's really exciting stuff. Um, conclusion, 6RD got us off the ground. It's the bulk of deployment still, but native IPv6 is beginning to pick up. And where it, native IPv6 exists, though there are some crazy people who want me to get mapped to work over 6RD, but besides those, it is possible, but <laughs> aside of that madness, um, MAP gives you this highly scalable way of facing IPv4 exhaustion. Now you, it's your particular ISP that you work for, may or may not have an exhaustion problem, but trust me, the world does. And that's why this is so important. And now deploying IPv6 gives you that scale it's not just, it's, it's very different than DS Lite or LW4.6, where they un, the, the layer underneath could have been MPLS. It could have been anything. With MAP, we're using that IPv6 aggregation by, route, by creating the mapping from V4 addresses and UDP ports and unlocking that power that exists in your network. So it's DS Lite with the scale of 6RD. HomeNet is taking IPv6 from the edge into the home and a whole lot more. We're not done yet. Join the IETF HomeNet mailing list, contribute, submit documents, tell us where we're doing things wrong, where we're doing things right. Uh, just don't tell anybody that we're actually working on stuff that is relevant beyond the home. And that's it. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Jan told me to put on this. Okay, thank you. Cool. We, we, I see we, we need a picture of Mark with a helmet. Yeah. This is cool. So, uh, Mark, thank you for this uh, presentation. Sorry, uh, Jan Jorge, uh, speaking uh, as a, a random guy from the internet. Um, uh, I really like the idea that you take a piece of hardware, and if you decide to use the stateless solution instead of stateful solution, um, you get much more out of the same piece of hardware that you can get with a stateful one from the obvious reasons. But your, um, your, what you said, is that just a calculated stuff or you actually tried that in the lab at Cisco? That was actually in the lab at Cisco. It's okay. running uh, XR430. Um, I can get you the more details if you want. That's actual stuff. So we are talking the real stuff. Yep. So now, I don't know if they actually built the 1.68 terabyte version. Okay. So, but they well, did test the 24 by 10 gig version, and so it, it runs at line rate. So presumably, it would continue to. So your your message is go stateless. Otherwise, you will you will pay us a lot of money. Uh, yeah, I mean for, for the hardware. The we'll we'll take your money. <laughs> you know, okay. pile them up. And but uh, you know, you know, for the health of the internet at large, I, I prefer the uh, stateless. Yeah. So, and the other question is um, <coughs> about the the home net stuff. You said no human touch needed, and I'm I was wondering how do you identify the border routers? Mm -hmm. There are multiple uh, alternatives underway. Um, at the simplest. Without, without a whole nother, you know, 15-minute presentation, um, we need to identify. Well, there's a couple of things. One, it can be a product-oriented uh, interface um, uh, border selection. So you actually have a labeled a WAN port, a LAN port. Okay. Well, we'd like to do a little bit better than that. Um, and you can start doing things like, oh, it's a PPPoE interface. Must be a WAN interface. Right, or I'm doing DHCPv6 PD, which you no longer have to do in the home because you're actually distributing the interfaces, distributing the addresses, the prefixes, with OSPF. Okay, so you answer OSPF hello with the home net extensions. You must be on the LAN side. You do, um, you get DHCPv6 PD. You must be on the WAN side. There's some few tricks in there about the size of the prefixes as well. But there's a variety of methods in there that lets you, you know, basically heuristics to identify, ah, this must be an ISP rather than an internally connected uh, router. And we're going to end up, um, you know, nailing down, you know, the, the recommended practice here. Um, that's the short answer. Then there's a whole, like, security consideration section that I'm just, like, blowing over. But that's, a, that's a, another half hour. Somebody back there and there, and I guess Hardmet's killing me. Okay, uh, you mentioned the source address selection on the end host. Yep. But uh, till now, the source address selection route uh, it works based on the routing uh, yep. information, and uh, if you get only default, it will always choose the same address. No. Today it chooses the source address based on longest match for the destination. It will, for a given destination, will always choose a given source, yes. But as you talk to different destinations, it'll choose different sources. So the, the, implement, the basic 3484 implementations for source selection in hosts today and this one right here, it's very simple in that regard. A source address is going to be selected per, by what's closest in terms of aggregation of the, IP, the actual destination and source IPv6 address, right? Uh, it, it tries to choose what's, what's quote unquote closest, but of course it breaks down and doesn't have uh, application semantics that I was talking about. Um, so that's what ha is happening today at the source. The, from just myopically looking at it from the home net's point of view, we don't care what, the, what source address the host selects. We're just going to make sure we route it correctly, problem number one. Second thing, 
pass as much information as possible when you configure that prefix. So take that, that, that interface information, you know, is it 3G, is it Wi-Fi, is it this, is it that, um, as well as any ISP provided information, is this a blue prefix, a green pre prefix, a red prefix, whatever, is it a mobility prefix, is it a walled garden, all that. You can propagate that through to at the point where the, the prefix or the address is configured in the host with the hope that the applications that are already coming along today that need that kind of information, but they can only get it if it's directly connected, can actually get it when that prefix is configured, okay? So that's the connecting of the, of the dots. And you're exactly right. We need to build that last piece, but that's what's that's what we're that's what we're working on, and that's what's coming next. And uh, are you support, for example, the vendors of smart TVs or guys, this kind of CP vendors? We're working on it at multiple angles, right? So we can and Cisco and the IETF can only do so much, right? Um, we can seed the market with open source. Okay, but do you, do you have this, some, um, this, for example, smart TVs is just an example, but this kind of stuff vendors on the board or they are? Kind of what vendors? S uh, smart TV, for example. Oh, smart TV. We, I, I've seen some stuff work in the lab. There's nothing actually um, uh, uh, in the marketplace yet. So thank you for there your was presentation. A, there's, oh, this thing's hot. It's I think me. we don't have time for more questions, ah. but you can talk with Mark Tonsley during uh, during the break. Yes, of course. Yes. So thank you very much for the uh, for attention and thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you.